Welcome to Mom and Mine, a podcast about maternal mental health, from conception to pregnancy and postpartum. Real stories from moms and family members who have made it from struggling to wellness, and interviews with experts and advocates who work for moms and families to get the help they need. We discuss very real struggles that can sometimes be hard to hear, but these are stories that need to be told so that moms and families can know that healing is possible. This podcast is meant to offer information and awareness and is not a replacement for treatment by a professional. Thank you for being with us today. This episode touches on topics that may be sensitive for some listeners. Welcome to Mom and Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. I'm so honored to have Dr. Diana Barnes on Mom and Mind today. She is an amazing person and a highly sought after presenter in maternal mental health. Diana Lynn Barnes is past president of Postpartum Support International and currently sits on their President's Advisory Council. She's a member of the training faculty of Maternal Mental Health Now in Los Angeles, as well as a California statewide Maternal Mental Health Collaborative and the 2020 Mom Project. She also sits as the mental health consultant for the California Commission on the Status of Maternal Mental Health Care. She is widely published in the academic literature on all facets of perinatal mental health, and wrote the guidelines on assessment and treatment of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders for the Perinatal Advisory Council of Los Angeles. In addition to private practice specializing in women's reproductive mental health, Dr. Barnes presents nationally and internationally and is often retained by legal counsel on cases of infanticide, pregnancy denial, and neonaticide, where perinatal illness has been at issue. In 2009, Dr. Barnes received a Lifetime Achievement Award for her contributions to the field of childbearing-related mood disorders. Dr. Barnes is the editor and contributing author of a 300-page reference text called Women's Reproductive Mental Health Across the Lifespan and co-author of The Journey to Parenthood, Myths, Reality, and What Really Matters. Dr. Barnes maintains a private practice in Sherman Oaks, California, where she specializes in women's reproductive mental health. Wow, Dr. Barnes, it's so amazing all that you've done. Welcome. Oh, thanks, Kat. I'm so I'm so happy to be here and please call me Diana. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Diana. I will. Um, I would love to start at your start, at your beginning of specializing in maternal mental health. Can you can you tell us how this all started for you? Yes. You know, it's hard to believe that I've been in this field for over 20 years. And as many of us have found our way to this work, so did I. Uh, My daughter is my younger child. And uh, in the first year after she was born, I was hospitalized four different times with extended hospitalizations of two to three weeks at a time. And nobody, we're going back to 1992 now, so nobody, absolutely nobody knew what was wrong with me. And I received all these different diagnoses and was given all these different kinds of treatments. And believe it or not, I never even heard the word postpartum depression until she was literally a year old. And by that time, I was in such a fragile state, both physically and emotionally, that I continued to relapse and was in and out of the hospital once again over the course of the next two years. So what should have been really, as we know in our field, what should have been a relatively brief course of treatment, uh, you know, maybe three to four months, took three years out of my life and out of my relationship with my daughter. So as you can well imagine, upon the heels of that, it was very clear to me. Um, you know, I came out of therapy school going, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to specialize in. Um, and it was interrupted, of course, by this postpartum depression. And so upon the heels of my recovery, it was very, very clear um, where my direction was. Oh, absolutely. So you were already uh, practicing in the field? I had just, I hadn't been licensed yet, but I had finished graduate school. And as we all do, I was starting my hours, and uh, then I gave birth and uh, was sidetracked for three years because of this really awful life-threatening postpartum depression. After a year, somebody mentioned it or mentioned postpartum depression? I have revisited... I've revisited my experience over and over again over the last 20 some years, you know, in in part because I do so much teaching and I want to understand it. And I also want to understand what happened to me and try to make sense of all of this. So some of my memory, believe it or not, is really pretty sketchy. But what I do remember, or at least what I have been told, um, is that there was no diagnosis of postpartum depression anywhere whatsoever until 
about a year after I gave birth. So during that time, the treatment before that time, the treatment that you were getting was just kind of... uh, It was kind of haphazard. Let's try this. Uh Let's try that. Um, Uh And very haphazardly without... And, you know, we know, you know, you and I know, those of us in our field really understand that treatment is not just about medication. Medication is often a very important adjunct and shouldn't be overlooked. Mm -hmm. But we... We also need to understand a a woman's experience of motherhood. Uh, And if we don't understand her experience, I think we miss the boat in terms of um, really helping her to heal. Right. Absolutely. Uh, So after three years of time, you started to feel like yourself? Started to get better slowly. Um, And it was just really, really clear to me that... um, this was the direction, this was, this was the field that I wanted to be in, and I have been. My practice is about 100% women's reproductive mental health. Amazing. Wow. Uh, so at that time, there must not have been a lot of information like there is now. There was relatively nothing. Postpartum Support International was in its infancy. Um, mm-hmm. I located them. Uh, There was depression after delivery at that time on the East Coast. I located them. Um, But the idea that anybody would specialize in this field, that was unheard of. I I imagine you and the other, I guess, if I can say, pioneers in this field, um, bringing it to where it is today, um, had to really dig around to find any information. Yeah, I I really learned primarily on what was out there, the little information that was out there, and pieced together my own experience as a teaching tool. Amazing. I mean, fortunately, Amazing. you know, now we're so beyond that in terms of access to information and research, and there's just such wonderful work being done out there. Right. This is this is very different than how, than yeah. how it was. Um, yet, still, so many women don't know what's going on. Um, it. It seems like it t- it takes a long time for it to trickle yes. down, I, I guess, to, to the mom who needs to know. Well, I think also, you know, despite the inroads that we've made, there still is so much stigma um, about depression and this whole, you know, buck up message and mm-hmm. what are you depressed about? You've got a beautiful baby. How can you be depressed? And uh, women are being held to literally unreasonable expectations. And when they come face to face... Um, with the discrepancies between what they are told by cultural ideals and how it really is, that in and of itself, you know, I think contributes to the psychology of pregnancy in the postpartum period. Absolutely. And I know you've talked a lot about and actually coined the phrase gestation of motherhood. Um, and it's a it's a fascinating perspective and look on on just what you're talking about, some of the factors that go into creating this challenge for moms feeling like they need to be happy and know everything. Yeah. Uh, can you please speak more to this idea of the gestation of motherhood and what that means and, and, and how that might apply to folks who are listening? Well, I, I think there, I, I want to say first that the, the whole idea, I think it's important that as often as we can, we dispel the whole idea of the maternal instinct um, yes. because it doesn't exist. Uh, yes. The instinct to protect, to want to nurture, absolutely that is instinctive. But the whole idea that you can know everything about your baby when you don't know them is a preposterous idea. And yeah. yet we expect women to buy into that. When I say we, I'm talking about the cultural, societal we, not us. Uh, we know better, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> but I, I have really, over the years, you know, coined the phrase the psychological gestation of motherhood traditionally and continues, I'm sad to say, even in some corners, even today, that yeah. when a woman is pregnant and she's receiving prenatal care, all we're thinking about is what's going on with her body and with the baby's body and is every, you know, is everybody physically okay? But we're mm-hmm. not paying attention and enough attention to the emotional life um, of this woman as she moves through pregnancy, as she prepares for the greatest and most profound transition of her life. And there is this psychological gestation, I think, that accompanies the physical gestation of pregnancy. Um, mm-hmm. And it has a lot of kind of, it's, it's developmental. And it, right. there are phases to it. You know, one of the ones that comes to mind quickly is 
the whole idea of envisioning yourself in the role of mother. You know, sometimes these processes are so unconscious that we're not even aware we're doing it. But, you know, I can remember in both of my pregnancies visualizing what it was going to be like, um, thinking about what I was worried about, thinking about what I was going to be welcoming, um, not, you know, certain things that probably I should have been thinking about that I wasn't thinking about, things like how my life was going to change so dramatically, particularly after my first and then again after my second, without, you know, without realizing. I mean, even something as simple as, oh, you've had one baby already, you know what to do. Second is a snap. I can't tell you how many women come to see me with symptoms of postpartum depression after the second child. Right. Um, So there is this kind of psychological, emotional process that underlies um, a woman's, you know, physical gestation of pregnancy. And we know that body and mind are connected. Uh, And we know that if a woman is depressed during her pregnancy, her fetus is at risk in in so many different ways, you know, low birth Mm -hmm. weight, prematurity, organ malformation, all kinds of things that we generally don't think about. And Mm -hmm. it's, you know, and it's often the result of what's going on in her emotional life. You touched on how our emotional state and what's happening for us and our transition to motherhood is, it can affect our, our child, our unborn child. In terms of the psychological gestation of motherhood and a mom's process through that, can you state or talk a little bit more about how the mind and, and body are connected? Well, you know, the dialogue between a mother and her unborn child is a chemical dialogue. We know that mm-hmm. stress crosses the placenta, um, severe anxiety crosses the placenta, um, depression crosses the placenta. So, you know, this is not in an effort to alarm any of your listeners. I mean, it doesn't mean if you have a stressful day that you're harming your baby. Right, we're, right. we're talking about, you know, undue, chronic, continuing stress, um, mm-hmm. you know, clinically diagnosed anxiety disorder or depression uh, mm-hmm. has an impact because we know that it actually creates chemical changes. We know that there are elevations in, in levels of things like um, cortisol, you know, the adrenal hormones, and babies experience this. Um, so when we're struggling because of anxiety or depression, that has an impact on what that baby is experiencing in the womb. So for the the mother's psychological gestation of her motherhood, how can we support that process for her, her psychological gestation to help uh, ease those symptoms or prevent some of of these things from happening? Well, you just mentioned something very important, I think, and that is the transgenerational transmission of experience Mm -hmm. and relationship. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the woman who is becoming a mother, particularly a mother for the first time, her relationship with her own mother factors into how she thinks about good mothering. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's a time when women, either consciously or unconsciously, and of course, when I'm seeing women during pregnancy, we we work with, you know, what's going on consciously, or at Mm -hmm. least bring it into awareness. Um, What was her relationship like with her own mother, and how did that have an impact on her own thinking about motherhood? Uh, I think the ways in which we can support new moms are to talk to them about the things that they are excited about as well as the things that they're anticipating, the struggles, uh, their Mm -hmm. definitions of good mother. We all Mm -hmm. have them and we get them from all kinds of sources. Um, But predominantly, we get them from our earliest attachment relationships with our own mothers. And I have countless examples of that in my own practice where a mother's um, kind of sensations, memories, sometimes unconscious, out of awareness of her relationship with her own mother, uh, come to the surface when she thinks about becoming a mother. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's very powerful. Uh, So uh, in in therapy specifically, Using the psychological gestation of of motherhood for the for any particular mom might include, or, or it sounds like very much includes trying to understand what their idea of mother is. Yes, who who is the good mother to her? 
Who does the good mother look like? Where did she get those ideas? Um, was this a relationship she had with her own mother? Uh, are there things about herself that she wants to change as she becomes a mother? Uh, are there qualities that she believes she needs to have as a mother in order to be an effective mom? You know, this is this is the most we we have so many societal as you know we have so many societal ideals about motherhood and how mothers should behave and how they should feel and how should they should look that we overlook how profound this experience is. You know, I often like to say when I'm when I'm teaching, you know, how often do we go into an experience as one person and come out as two people? Right. Uh, never. <laughs> you know, and yet we don't take stock of that. We say to mm-hmm. mothers, uh, you give birth and then you go back to life the way you knew it. How can you possibly go back to life the way you knew it? It's not the same. Right. It's different. So, you know, when it's so different uh, and yet we expect women to just pick up where they left off as though nothing important or sacred has really happened in their life. And I think this, if anything, contributes to this downward spiral of depression and anxiety that we know is more common than we'd like to think. Oh, well, right. Absolutely. Um, So this is, uh, this seems to be maybe a potentially a new perspective to be offering healthcare providers um, or not new to you, but certainly maybe new to listeners um, to understand, uh, you know, maybe that the OB in the office or the pediatrician or the nurse isn't able to grasp these kinds of ideas in their five minute, uh, five minute meeting with a mom, but therapists maybe who are listening um, in terms of integrating this and, and into their practice or the moms who are listening and who want to really understand this part of themselves. Is there any particular kind of guidance or ideas that would be helpful for them? Well, certainly when it comes to the healthcare provider, sometimes mm-hmm. it's just as simple as asking a mother during her pregnancy, how are you doing? Right. Are the things that are coming up for you, are the mm-hmm. things you're worried about? Now, as you say, you know, um, time becomes essential, doesn't it, in these kinds mm-hmm. of settings? Um, certainly with therapists, time is not as um, perhaps um, disjointed or let me say that again. Perhaps for therapists, it may be a little easier to delve into these questions because there's more time. But sometimes Mm -hmm. just asking a mom, and even in the postpartum period, if a doctor just says to a mom, how are you sleeping? It's the most innocuous way in which you can intervene. Mm -hmm. Anybody, and it's harmless because most people will tell you how they're sleeping. Mm -hmm. They're not ashamed Mm -hmm. of how they're sleeping. There's no stigma whether they're sleeping or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that opens the door to a whole conversation. And sometimes just asking a mom how she's sleeping in the postpartum period or even during pregnancy, she'll burst mm-hmm. into tears. Right. And there, so that true. opens the door to a conversation. Absolutely. And so d- then just having a touch point, even if somebody doesn't have an hour or 45 minutes or half an hour or 10 minutes to talk, just asking a really honest uh, and meaningful question. Absolutely. Really- exactly mm-hmm. right. Absolutely. Great. Fantastic. So I- I'm hopeful that folks will... Uh, you know, I could talk to you forever about this. Um, And and I know you do uh, a lot of talks about the psychological gestation of motherhood. So it's great to get a snapshot of it here. Um, But I think you you go into a lot more detail in your books um, about these ideas. I, Um, well, thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate it always. Um, My reference text uh, called Women's Reproductive Mental Health Across the Lifespan, I actually wrote the chapter on the psychological gestation of motherhood. Right. Absolutely. I own that book. I reference it all the time. Oh, how nice. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's on my bookshelf. Um, So in terms of, you have two books. You have the Women's Reproductive Mental Health Across the Lifespan, which is That's the most recent book. Um, And then my other book, uh, my earlier book is called The Journey to Parenthood, Myths, Reality, and What Really Matters. Absolutely. So that book also goes into some of these ideas. And that book Mm -hmm. actually consists of interviews with what we we did in that book. I had a a co-author on that project. And what we did in that book was we 
we interviewed, I think it was about 40 couples, and we interviewed them during their pregnancies. And then we went back after they had given birth and took a look again and looked particularly about how their expectations, did their expectations mesh with the reality of what they were experiencing. And uh, had some, you know, surprising conversations. All right. I think that is such an important perspective uh, to bring to parents. There's, you know, there can often be all this hope and joy, which is essential and fantastic. Right. Uh, but also, as you were mentioning before, we don't talk about the other stuff, right. the, the how things are going to be changing. And for, for people to be able to see the difference, pregnancy to postpartum of real people is a, an amazing resource. And, and it's, you know, it's it's very nuanced, Kat, but I think it's it's important mentioning that, of course, this is a, we, we want this to be a joyous time. Yeah. We want women to feel exhilarated and excited that they have a baby. Uh, but I think what we overlook is that we don't give voice or we should be giving voice to the authentic and real experiences of mothers. Because even when there's joy, there may be worry. Mm -hmm. you know, even when there's joy, there may be sadness about the life that was left behind and the responsibilities and how overwhelming the responsibilities are. Uh, so there needs to be room in our kind of lexicon and our language, uh, that we use to talk about this time in a woman's life. There needs to be room to talk about all these different kinds of coexisting experiences, emotional experiences and feelings. Right. And so addressing some of those, uh, maybe conflicted feelings or feelings that feel like we're not supposed to have, uh, like, you know, we're supposed to love our babies all the right. time and never have any negative thoughts. Right. Uh, discussing those can open the door wider to feel all of the good feelings. And the whole idea of availability, which I think, um, which I talk at length about in, in my chapter in my book, which is, you know, women's ideas about what it means to be available. And we've gone to such an extreme that women actually feel, a lot of women actually feel guilty if they, you know, take an hour to, let's say, go for a walk so that they can rejuvenate themselves so that they can then come back and feel more present with their babies. They feel guilt about it. Hmm. Why are we doing this to ourselves, yeah. to each other? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's not okay. Um, and so addressing this is very important. And self-care. Um, which is part of the, you know, part of an, any important wellness plan is self-care. And it's the hardest thing for us as women to do. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I struggle with it every single day. Well, it's a, it's a work in um, process, yes, a work in progress. Definitely. For the women's reproductive mental health across the lifespan, you touch on or the book and you touch on several different topics uh, spanning the range of reproductive topics. Can you give just a snapshot of a couple of things that are addressed in the book? Yeah, we start all the way at the very, very beginning, looking at what's going on in the womb in towards of the psychological, in terms of the psychological development of the infant and the female infant. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we know that the the emotional life and the physical life of women, the reproductive life and the psychological life of women are very delicately intertwined. And mm -hmm. we know that what happens in the postpartum period or during pregnancy is often the result of earlier times in a woman's life where she has had uh, psychological or physiological challenges. Mm -hmm. So when we attempt to kind of, or let me put it this way, I think what I hoped to successfully do in this particular reference text was to show that we are not isolated events as women, mm -hmm. that yes. we are a continuum that wow. begins even before we are born. And so some of the things that we touch on are, or that I touch on in the book with the, the incredible, I was so fortunate in some of the most unbelievable researchers and clinicians mm -hmm. all over the world who agreed to contribute to this volume. Um, so we discuss things like uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, uh, mm -hmm. birth control and its implications for reproductive mental health, 
Uh, we talk about eating disorders. We talk about mm -hmm. the biological time clock and fertility. Um, mm -hmm. Psychological gestation of motherhood, as I mentioned. Um, a pregnancy loss. Uh, mm -hmm. So just the whole range of women's reproductive experiences and how that taps into our mental health. Um, I, it's, it's so profound the way you described that we are not a single event, that we are, we are on this timeline. That is so amazing. It's such a good way to, to think about us. It's not like you said before, we don't just have a baby and then go back to right. how things were before, whatever that means. Right. Uh, there's this whole continuum of experience that shapes us as we go along. And this, this reference text addresses all of those topics. It's, it's really a wealth of information. Well, certainly when I'm sitting with a mom, uh, whether it's during pregnancy or in the postpartum period, I'm not just interested in what's happening now. I'm interested mm -hmm. in all the things that came before because you and I know that those are risk factors too. Yeah. And, you know, we have to understand a woman's story. If we just identify symptoms. And I guess maybe that's what the psychological gestation of motherhood is all about. It's about mm -hmm. understanding a woman's story. If we just mm -hmm. rely on symptoms without understanding the underlying story, uh, I, I think that in of itself can often be very isolating and stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so with all of the, the work that you, you've done and that you continue to do, um, do you have any words of hope or advice for those who may be struggling now or who are not sure what's going on for them uh, about, you know, their, their process and how they can feel better? Well, first of all, postpartum depression, we know, is treatable. It's absolutely treatable. Even though it's one of the most common complications of pregnancy, we absolutely know how to treat it. Um, and it's important for women and their families to educate themselves so that they understand what's happening to them when it does. I mean, I can tell you that I had absolutely no idea what was happening to me other than I thought I was going off the deep end, um, as many women do feel. And so the more we can educate ourselves, understand what's happening when it does, you know, it's not unlike when we educate women about breast cancer, what to look for, how to self-examine. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Right. Uh, you know, or stroke or, or, you know, heart attack. It's the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. And we need to pay attention to it in the same way. You know, we do all of these risk assessments during, uh, during a woman's uh, pregnancy. You know, we test for spina bifida, neural tube defects, and Down syndrome. And, mm -hmm. and we never ask the questions. You know, right. what's your history of depression? Have you had, you know, what's the family history? What's the personal history? What are the stressors in your life? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that sounds simple. Yes, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It seems like we should be able to do that. And I, it, and you and other, other experts and organizations are working very, very hard to make sure that that happens and that all women um, uh, get looked at and, uh, and addressed in the proper way uh, in terms of their mental wellness. Um, so the, the work that you're doing is, is making an impact. I hope so. Uh, I really do. Is. You know, it my is. daughter, my daughter has often said to me over the years, um, and of course she could train the best of them because she, know, <laughs> she knows about <laughs> postpartum depression, but right. she's said to me over the years, mom, am I, you know, am I going to get this? Um, and I've said to her, you know, yes, you are at risk, but right. we know what to do. Right. Um, yes. We know what to do. Right. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be this, uh, oh, my gosh, what is this thing? I'm going to do it all yeah. by myself and figure it out all by myself. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's a, such a great point. Um, Diana, I could talk to you forever. Aww. And uh, <laughs> there's so many more things to address. Um, and we haven't even touched on a lot of your other expertise in um and being an expert witness in cases of infanticide and pregnancy des denial and, you know, nadicide and, and your, your work um, with folks who are dealing with postpartum psychosis, would you be up for and willing to come back and talk about those things on another episode? Absolutely. I'd be honored to come back. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Well, I thank you so much for being with us today. You are a wealth of information, and I hope that folks understand how lucky they are to be hearing straight from you um, all of this awesome information. Oh, that's so kind. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. By joining us today and listening, you're a part of the growing community of people who are aware and concerned for mothers and families during this beautiful and sometimes very difficult time of life. Please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review this free podcast so that Mom and Mind can be found by moms, families, and providers who will benefit from hearing our talks. If you or someone you know is having a hard time, help is available. Please look for resources for help at momandmind.com, where you will also find links and information from today's episode. Thank you for listening and being a part of the Mom and Mind community.